thank you for joining us. Welcome to this is our podcast, Muslim Viewpoint, powered by American Muslim Today. My name is Maya Gaylor. I'm a multimedia reporter here. I'll be doing your interview today. So we're just gonna, you know, talk about you, your campaign, and then you know, just some kind of key issues that are going on pretty much on everyone's, you know, platform. Mm -hmm. So if you kind of just want to start by maybe telling us about you personally, your background, how you landed here. Sure. Yeah. Well, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak with your audience, Maya. So my name is Paul King. I'm 60 years old. I live on the Rockaway Peninsula, which is uh, part of Congressional District 5. I'm going up against Gregory Meeks. I didn't plan on becoming a, a politician. I've been very active in the community on the civic level. So I'm president of my local civic. I'm on my community board. Uh, I've been active in youth sports for decades. I'm a family man, a business owner. I'm a man of faith. You know, I try to do right by the community like my, my parents did before me. You know, I think things have really gone sideways the last few years. I think I'm worried about the future for my children and my grandchildren, the America they're going to grow up in. So I figured now is the time to step in. And my day job is I'm a management consultant, but my focus is on systemic problem solving. So you know when people say the system's broken, no one really knows what that means in terms of how do you fix it. So what politicians do, the government does, they tend to throw money at as I metaphorically say, at the fire, but not at the root causes. So when it's th all the things that impact opportunity, for instance, in this country, whether it's education, access to jobs, uh, access to capital, things that are kind of the engine of the building blocks of the American dream, I think they're all broken and I know how to fix them. And that's my skill set. So my life experience actually sets me up to do this job for, uh, for the country really well. And I just want to set some things right and turn the keys over to the next generation. Uh, I'm not looking for a career. Right. Well, thank you. And then as you mentioned, uh, the incumbent Democrat Gregory Meeks, who has held the position uh, for over a decade now, about a decade. He's been there since 2013. Why have you decided to challenge him as the Republican candidate? Uh, what changes do you want to see implemented in your community? Yeah, and, and while he's been my congressman since 2013, he's actually, you know, they redraw lines. He's actually been the congressman in Southeast Queens since 1998. So this is his 26th year. And while, you know, I appreciate his long service to the country, he said a couple of years ago, I don't understand the job. It's not that I don't understand the job. I understand, that, in my opinion, that the vast majority of the congressmen are doing it wrong, that they know how to play the game. They bring some money back to the district and like to earn re-election. Uh, but when public opinion of, of Congress is like at 12 percent approval and re-election is at 95 percent, you know something's broken. And really the critical thing that he doesn't do is make any changes. He doesn't have any accountability for improving the lives of the folks here. You know, it's great to put out a press release every spring saying, hey, I spent, I brought back $15 million to do X, Y, and Z, and those are all good things. But then it's like, hands off. As a systems thinker, as a problem solver, right, the money is just a, a starting point, you've, and you've got to apply your efforts properly. So in the, my district is extremely diverse, and a neighborhood like mine, over the 50 years I've lived here, has gotten better over the years. But a lot of neighborhoods I look, they're not, they're not much different than they were in the 1970s or the or 1980s. The schools are terrible. There's no access to jobs. People don't have, and really, they don't believe the American dream exists. And that's a systemic failure. Like I said, that's, that's what I do for a living. So I want to go in there, fix the schools, fix access to jobs, improve the economy. Also want to do things that will roll back policies that Gregory Meeks supported that drove up the cost of living. You know, that spike from 1.9% inflation to 9.1% inflation was largely driven by bad policy in Washington. And he doesn't get that. I do. I understand how you know bad spending, bad fiscal policy, and also bad energy policies hurt everyone, but especially working class people. We have so many people in our district that are living paycheck to paycheck. And when you just can't afford to fill up the bag of groceries and you have a family, that's just wrong. And as you mentioned, and as we all kind of know and understand, New York is a very diverse place made up of immigrants from all over the world, every corner. So can you could just tell us, you know, you've had maybe a pretty strong stance on immigration, immigration reform. So can you tell us, you know, what are some pathways that you're looking at in terms of helping those who are already here in this country and um, those who are stalled at the border? Right. You know, and I think there's a few different buckets here. You know, my gentleman I'm challenging, you know, Mr. Meeks, you know, he likes to say, well, we need comprehensive immigration reform. Well, he's been there 26 years and he hasn't done anything about that. Um, I happen to agree. I know that 
people, it's become such a polarized issue that we don't solve the problem. You know, if a Republican like me says, I want comprehensive immigration reform, people start calling me a rhino or saying, you just want an asylum. I want it so that we solve the problem that we had prior to President Biden ripping the border open, where we've got millions of people in limbo. I think they were close to a solution in you know, 2008, around then. I think they need to go back to that, have the courage to pull both sides together and say, here's what's fair for the people who've kind of been stuck in limbo. Here's how we make legal immigration more efficient and the whole path to becoming, getting right to, to stay in the country, green card, citizenship, because I mean, that, that's a big part of the engine of success of America. It's like my grandfather's off the boat from Italy. I mean, everyone's got an, an immigrants in our family. No one's this purebred America because there's no such thing. So you know, immigration has to work and work right. What's really gone wrong the last three years, and we're feeling it terribly here in Southeast Queens, is that wide open border. It's so wrong, you know, it's enabled human trafficking, you know, not intentionally, but the cartels are getting rich and abusing people who are trying to get to America. Border states have a hard time, and people in, in my district are really suffering because we've had, like say, the hotels around JFK, some of them have been taken over by people who, frankly, are here illegal, illegally, that's not, you know, just, they're using asylum as a way, like a magic word to get in, in the door, but they really don't, most of them don't have asylum claims, and they're just stuck there, and they're spilling out into the neighborhood. They're, you know, the people who are like, trying to live their American dream, kind of lower middle class, people who are first time homeowners, they're overwhelmed, the schools are overwhelmed. So it's, the, the impacts are terrible in our district, but you know, so we've got to solve that problem by fixing the southern border, because as long as they keep flowing in, we'll never be able to handle it in New York, and New Yorkers will keep suffering. We've got to cut off the flow and get back to having real rules where we decide who gets in the country, not the cartels, and we decide how people get in the country. You've got to follow the laws, and that's you know, been a terrible burden for people in our district. Right, and uh, as far as education goes, um, a lot of parents are looking for maybe more school choice or perhaps more public funding. Um, I have noticed that it's a trend kind of among all states. Everyone is kind of fighting for better education, better access, better funding. So can you kind of just tell us maybe what are some of your plans if elected to Congress, how you would help your district? As you say, there are a lot of schools who are not receiving the proper funding. How would you go about that? Well, it's not about funding in New York City. We send, we spend in, amazingly large amount of money and get really bad results. And we've been doing it year after year. Over the last pre-pandemic, so not even the pandemic impact, I think fourth grade reading on average went from like 38% to 39.7% over a 12 year period pre-pandemic. That's it's almost no improvement. It, it barely crawls up. And that 60% of our kids can't read at grade level. We've failed a whole generation. We're undermining their potential. So there's a lot we need to do to fix the schools, but the problem isn't money being spent in the classroom, this is kind of the system's thinking. It's what's happening upstream. We need to help parents. We have a lot of young parents who are sometimes single parents, very young, to help them succeed and helping their kids succeed. S same for teachers. There are all these things we should be doing upstream that set the children up for success when you get to the classroom, set the teachers up for success, and the parents too. So that's my focus. And like when you look at the whole educational journey, I'm mostly focused on the early years because we for you know meant well as a, as a country but you know especially under the Obama years the early 2000s it became how do we get more diverse people into college and we put all our efforts at the top well if you're failing people in the early in life you're setting them up for failure in college so and most people don't go to college so one thing is we need to think systemically to fix education and I think school choice is a part of it I don't think charter schools are some sort of panacea but in the short term I think they help I went to a, what was effectively a magnet school and I got a great high school education they didn't call it that back in my day but you know we need more changes more innovation for, you know for, and to give parents more choices because sometimes it's hey you only have to go to this failing school uh, when you do get to high school again it's not all about passing a test and getting to college. We need to bring back trade skills, but also add new professional skills, whether it's computer programming, project management, kind of basic level certifications. This is what I do part of this in my, in my career, professional development. So you give people life skills. So if they don't want to go to college, they better they have a better chance of being productive and getting a job and getting a career off the right foot. And it's, it doesn't hurt them if they go to college too. It's still a, still a good foundation. So I think we need to do a lot of re rethinking education. So the foundation's solid and there are more paths to success uh, once you're getting out of high school. And in terms of healthcare, specifically women's healthcare has become a very 
hot button issue in this election cycle since we are dealing with the effects of Roe v. Wade uh, being overturned. Mm -hmm. Now the women's access to full health care abortion is in the hands of the states. So this has led to many women, you know, a lot of horror stories, really. Women traveling out of state, uh, still dying, just really bad cases. As a Congress member, do you think that this issue should stay in the state's hands? Do you think it should be federal? Well, a couple of things. One is it it has robed the demise of Roe v. Wade had absolutely zero impact here in New York State. We've got the most liberal abortion laws and nothing's changed. Frankly, the Democrats are abusing the issue like they're trying to use it to drum up votes this election cycle, even though they know it has nothing to do with anything that, that you know in New York. But this is a serious issue and it's been a, st a difficult issue over my entire lifetime because you, it's the collision of two fundamental rights, the right to control your own body and the right to life, which we need to some people will say, oh, well, you know, life begins at conception. Or some people will say, well, life doesn't count until you get your first breath. Uh, the vast majority of people feel like it's somewhere in the middle. And where that point is, I think we're going to spend years as a country debating it and hopefully come to a consensus. Uh, frankly, I think anything that's going to happen in Congress uh, while my time there, because I don't want to be there a long time, you know, four or six years, it's going to be political theater, especially in the short term. They're going to, people are going to, whoever's in control of whatever chamber, they're going to come up with a bill that can't possibly pass, that's not a compromise, that plays to the base of whosoever base it is, not even picking on a side, and they're gonna put up, I won't even vote for anything like that. I'll, I'll be present and vote present. I just, I don't wanna be part of the theatrics. It's it's a long, it's gonna take a long time to, to sort this out. And you've mentioned that you personally are Catholic. We are American Muslim today, as we don't, not specifically faith-based, but we do obviously cater to our audience and um, hear their concerns. And we just wanted to know, as a candidate in your community, how have you reached out to other faith groups, um, other minority groups, if you have, and what kind of feedback have you uh, received from them? Oh, well, I mean, specifically with Muslims, I will I go to a mosque every Friday. I get to speak. Uh, they allow me to speak before Friday prayers. Uh, I spend time people outside. We have a lot of Bengali Muslims in uh, the hillside area, so I spend a, a big chunk of my time there. I'm up there twice a week. I have a team of Bengalis who are leading the effort, leading the charge locally. And I am I find I'm very well received in, in the mosque because I don't really spend a lot of time talking about policy. I, I'll do a quick brush of, here's what I believe the American dream. You're all immigrants. Here's what we should be doing to support your first generation Americans, immigrants and such. I talk more about faith because, you know, my jo sort of joke is, you know, people say to me, you're a Republican. You must want to make America great again. I want to make America good again. I think that since our founding, we've been a faith-based country. Obviously, it's secular, but you know the founding documents say our rights come from God. They don't say they come from government or from man. And I think whether you're Muslim, Hindu, you know, Christian, or, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Sikh, we all believe in good versus evil. We're striving to be better, to be good. And I think that's part of the American, what keeps America successful. And so people of faith, I am happy to see people of faith. When I go to the Jamaican Muslim Center, there's literally a thousand people. It spills out onto the streets who are praying Friday prayers at one o'clock. And I think that's important to the country because it's important to our society. And good people need to step up. And that's why I try to encourage them a lot. A lot of these folks don't vote. I'm like, if you want to shape the world for good, you, you can't sit on the sidelines. And uh, that's, that's really important to actually you know, saving New York and, and saving America, I think. Right, and that's a good point um, as a Republican, but also I've noticed you're in a common sense party, which is, uh, is that nationally recognized or is that in New York? No, it's, you know, at the state level, you're, a, you're actually a, able to add in New York additional columns. I, it doesn't impact me at all. It's like I'm a, it's a Republican or a slash common sense or conservative slash common sense. So I was just helping out some other guys who are running for a state assembly, state senate, get signatures for a third party. I said, I don't even want to be, I don't even want it on the, on, on the ballot. Not that there, there's anything wrong with it. I just think it confuses people at my level, but this, they, they put it on the ballot. Well, as someone who's on the Republican ticket, what has, have been your thoughts in this presidential election going into it? Um, you know, Biden dropping out and then Harris taking his place and Trump being in the race again. Uh, as a Republican, do you support Trump? What are your thoughts? H how would you even encourage people to vote, really? Well, I always say vote your conscience, vote your values. I, I don't always vote Republican. I try to vote for whoever's, whoever's best. I think this whole journey we've been on, 
President Biden, it's been a long time since he shouldn't he shouldn't be president now. It should be President Harris. He's he's not capable. And it's not and that's not that I like or dislike Kamala Harris. It's like that's what you're there for as a vice president. And uh, you know, so we went on this long uh, charade of pretending he was capable, and now he's he's invisible. Um, so now that she's a candidate, I think her weaknesses are showing just as they did in 2020. You know, she was. She shot up, and then people looked at her and shot back down. So I expect, you know, I know if the election were held today, it'd be close, and President Trump would probably become, you know, president again. I will work with either of them to get my agenda done, which is, you know, to improve, restore the American dream. It'll be easier for me to work with President Trump, not just because he's a Republican, and I'll have that leverage there. He's also a guy from Queens. The house he grew up in, or house he was, you know, he lived at when he was born, is in my district. So I think I'll be able to leverage some of that kind of loyalty to home to say, listen, here are problems. You've got to be the guy to fix that. You, you take all the credit. Here are the ideas. Let's, let's go. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. King, for joining us today. Do you have any final closing remarks that you would like to share with us? Just that I'm running for Congress, you know, again, at my age, not that I'm so old, again, because you know, I've got the ex my life experience and skills, and I, I see what's gone wrong, especially on a systemic level. Um, it's everything in my life prepared me to do the job right now, not to go and be a politician who just goes along with the party or tries to build power. I want to fix things, make it right, make, you know, make it fair for everyone, and I say turn the, cheese, the keys over to the next generation so that you guys can continue to live your American dream. All right. Well, thank you again.